I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, hackable cities and their community dynamics. This is something that I'm incredibly passionate about. Um, and I think if my clicker is working, yes, love that. There was a, a clicker rehab happening uh, between uh, during our break. So I'm really, really passionate about hackable cities. Uh, if you're on Twitter, you can find me at Corbett3000. I'm the a former advisor for Code for America. I'm a current advisor to Code for Europe. Does anyone know what those things are? So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. It's super exciting. Uh, I'm an advisor to Apps for Europe, a pan-European a pan competition for, for developers to build web and mobile applications to help their fellow citizens using open data, uh, and created Apps for Democracy. I'm the CEO of iStrategy Labs, which we got a little bit of an intro about it. I'm not going to talk to you that much about iStrategy Labs, but um, I started this company uh, God, seven years ago after getting laid off from a, a creative agency. Um, I was doing my job too well, apparently. I was closing new business and making the company a lot of money, and they were going to have to pay me too much, and they said, I guess we'll just fire him instead of actually pay him that money. So it was very motivational, I can say, to have that having, had happen. And now today we're just about 62 people, uh, totally bootstrapped, and we were designers, developers, and strategists, which is a really awesome combination, uh, which means we really live these two things. I think a lot about applications all day long, and I think a lot about people. And I think we talk about sort of open innovation or open data in a, you know, in a civic context. A lot of people forget, they forget about the people. They think a lot about the apps, like, oh, we're going to create open APIs so that we can get, uh, you know, data feeds about crime or school test scores or locations of, you know, potholes in the city. And, and they forget about the fact that all this has to be designed around what the citizens actually want. Uh, and so it seems that now, globally, over the past, I'll say five to seven or eight years, um, governments are really starting to get it. It sounds like here in Perth, you guys are really starting to get that. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the projects I've seen all over the world uh, that either have been influenced through uh, apps for democracy or otherwise. So let me tell you a little bit about this thing. Um, God, about seven years ago, I was just a guy in his apartment with this company called iStrategy Lab, CEO of one. Right, that's how a lot of entrepreneurs start. Uh, how many people are CEOs of one in the room? Love that. I will be buying you drinks later, tonight, <laughs> tomorrow, whenever. Um, and hopefully it's more than one. If you want more than one, great. If, if you don't, that's fine too. So when it was just me, uh, the CTO of Washington DC, the chief technology officer of the city, uh, he had heard about me. He said, Peter, I heard you were this guy that knows how to do weird things with technology. And I thought, that's the best possible reputation I could ever have. I'm done. I'm 27. I've made it. Right? And I said, okay, great. And so, you know, the CTO of your city emails you and says, I want to meet you. You, of course, go. So I go there and I said, so how can I help? And he, he showed me this. And sadly, this uh, website is exactly the same today, seven years later. If you go to data.octo.dc.gov, you'll see it. And he said, Peter, this is the data catalog for the city. This is 400 data feeds, real-time crime statistics, school test scores, juvenile arrests and charges. Unfortunately, there are a lot of those in Washington, D.C. Uh, purchase orders, the details of every transaction that the government uh, goes through when they're procuring services. And he said, if you were me, uh, what would you do with this? Because this is really not useful for basically anybody, except for some developers who, for whatever reason, care about this already and know about it. Uh, there's shape files, right? So who, how many GIS geeks in the room in any way, shape, or form? So GIS files for all the city buildings and all the block-by-block -block zones and all that stuff. And I said, interesting. Um, you know, what I would do, I'd try and do something completely different. I would say, let's take all that open data, which, to be honest, seven years ago, the D.C. government was leading the world with regard to open municipal data. That was, a th that was not even a phrase that other cities were using. So it had a 400-record data catalog. So let's take that data, let's combine it with open source technology, let's take citizen talent, and that's really the 2.0 piece. We've, already ha we've, we've had open data in the past, we've had open source in the past, this was 2007 or 8. Uh, but what we hadn't done is governments hadn't said, well, Citizens, well, they, they are us, and even government officials are citizens. Imagine that. Um, they're just as smart as us. Maybe they could build things better than the people who are paying millions of dollars to build and who aren't really incentivized to ever really finish. Let's really focus our attention on the things they want, let them build it, and maybe you add a little bit of fame and fortune so that there's an incentive. We are humans at the end of the day. We do, at the end of the day, think of our own self-interest, and we say, you know, if I build something cool, maybe... 
You know, maybe the mayor will give me a pat on the back and my grandma will finally know that I don't just work with computers. Because that's really what my grandma thinks I do. And she doesn't even, I don't, she, she's never been on the internet. She's 95, which is incredible. Uh, so what happens when you add those things together? Uh, in the first year, uh, there were 47 web, iPhone, and Facebook applications developed by citizens. These are just, you know, friends of mine, people that heard about the competition that said, you know, I want to build something to help my city be a better place. Uh, that yellow line item there, the value, that was the amount of money the city government estimated the applications were worth if they had procured them. The weird part, maybe that's weird if you understand government, the most expensive component wasn't the developer time, like the people actually building the things. It was the internal cost of the project managers and procurement officers. <laughs> so when you remove all that stuff and you just let citizens build things on an open platform you've created, you can do a lot. Uh, it cost the government $50,000. That was essentially a grant for prizes and having us run the competition. Call 4,000% RPI uh, or ROI. Uh, this is what the website uh, looked like at the time. If you search for Apps for Democracy Guide, you'll find a, a beautifully done PDF that will teach you how to run these things. Um, and it's been downloaded, I think, 40,000 times. And in the past five years, this has popped up in over 50 countries around the world. And I should say again, it was just me. Actually, I might have had one employee by the end of the competition. Um, just me at the time. I didn't do this because I was like, oh, I'm going to like make a ton of money and like sell this as an open innovation strategy all over the world. Um, I just wanted to do something that made sense for my city. And that's a key insight, I think, for anybody. Uh, people who have some form of civic pride, uh, they have like a boundless amount of energy and capacity to do great things. And so, you know, I, I started getting phone calls from all over the world. I probably got 2,000 emails in the course of the first couple of weeks after Apps for Democracy concluded because there's a big burst of attention. And, you know, I'm getting emails and phone calls from Finland. Where's Timo here? Love, love Helsinki. Spent like four weeks there now. And Apps for Finland, if you know anything about it, was through me going there and teaching your, your country's CTO that he actually could release his data. So I became this like, Peter, come to Finland and like show them the stuff so that we can do it too. And this guy had been the CTO for 40 years. And so the open innovation community in Finland was like, I forget his name. They're like, he's never going to let the data be free. And so then I walk in, I show him a couple slides and they're like, yep, we can do that. Right? A very, the very understated Finnish competition, like, yes, we can do that. We, we can actually do that much better than you. Right? <laughs> awesome. So, and they're so humble. They're like, our food isn't very good. I'm like, it's delicious. Are you kidding me? Okay. So let's see. Actually, and I will touch on apps for the army. All of these things were mostly, you, know, you got apps for Finland, Denmark, Norway, Belgium, Berlin, Amsterdam, Holland, Australia. There was apps for New South Wales. Did anyone participate in that? Anyone see that? Um, how many people in the room are developers themselves? Couple hands. Okay, cool. Uh, on my clicker now is falling asleep. See, I, it gets tired. It's like fatigued. Come on. Come on, clicker. There we go. Um, so all sorts of applications were out. This is one of my favorite ones. Um, and I'll tell you why. So uh, we actually heard about an interactive voice response system being built. Greta had mentioned that some people don't have access to the web. They don't have a mobile phone that they're going to text with. They're just going to use the phone, right? And so this application, first, there was certainly a web interface. But for people that wanted to find out if uh, that pothole was fixed or this, the cracked sidewalk got repaired in front of their house, uh, someone used Asterix, which is an interactive voice response open source platform, so that grandma could call the phone number, punch in her zip code, and it would read back to her all the things that were getting fixed. Right? <laughs> Built in four days by a citizen. How much do you think that would have cost if the government procured it? Right? Millions of dollars. And mind you, this system is not in use today. That's sad. I wish that it were. Uh, but at least we didn't waste the money on a system that wasn't going to be used today. Right? Like, let these ideas bloom and then die themselves. That's okay. Let the citizens build the ideas that can bloom and die or bloom and thrive. Right? And some of those things certainly do thrive. Um, one of my favorites as well was uh, Stumble Safely. This is a heat map of the liquor licenses in Washington, D.C. Uh, that <laughs> overlays the, the, the crime uh, in the city. So, unfortunately, I think those X's are stabbings. Um, <laughs> Something like that. DC's gotten much better. I don't know if you ever knew. DC was like the murder capital of the world in the 80s, and now it's much better. This one was really interesting. Now, I don't think the user interface design is, is so sweet, 
But what's interesting here, these black parking meters are broken parking meters. Uh, the black dots, the little black dots, and I have a laser pointer here, don't I? The little black dots, those are stolen cars. Uh, the red parking meters are ones that cost money and the rest is free. So first of all, this application was built to show you like, if you're going to go somewhere in the city, should you drive or should you take the metro or what should you do? And maybe there's too many stolen cars in that area, so maybe I won't do that. The most interesting piece though was, uh, I was sitting with the city administrator, who's you know basically the, the second most important person in the city behind the mayor, I guess you could say, and the CTO and the developer who built this. So usually when you're a developer, this guy was probably 26. You're never gonna meet the CTO of your city, maybe, or you're, you're not gonna talk to the city administrator. And they said, Sean, tell us about the black meter. He's like, yeah, it's weird. I ran this little script and I did an average to understand like how long the black meter stayed on the map. And I saw an average that they disappear after six days, meaning they got fixed, right? Because this is real time data. And the city administrator is like, huh, that's odd because our service level agreement with the parking meter company is that they have to fix these things in 24 hours. So they've been violating our contract for however long. You've got a 26 year old developer who built an app for free showing the city they're wasting millions of dollars, right? And why isn't the city figuring this out themselves? Well, probably because they don't have time, right? They've got to do other things. And so let your citizens do the things you don't have time to do. Right? Instead of thinking you have to do it all and, oh, we're, we're the only ones that can really figure this stuff out. I'm pretty sure that a 26-year-old developer figured it out much better than the city administrator and the CTO had. But that's why they brought us in. That's why they wanted this to happen. What's so interesting about the things that were developed during Apps for Democracy, there's sort of subsequent innovation that happens afterwards that you can't really account for. Uh, and so these are screenshots from my, my iPhone at the time uh, this was called Are You Safe DC? And it's an iPhone app that, based on your geolocation as you're walking through a city, it can show you a simple sort of threat, threat meter. I don't want to call it a threat meter, but it's sort of, that's sort of what it is. Uh, and on the left-hand side, so I took these screenshots one night when uh, I went out at night, and if you can see the address is Northeast DC, which is really rough, but really cool, right? So like all the coolest clubs, and like, it's just, it's awesome. So I went out there, my car got towed. I was like, oh shit, pardon my French. Anyway, so I was like, oh shit, you know, my car got towed, let me use this thing. So you can imagine anywhere, you know, where you have a lot where tars, cars get towed to, not the best places. And by the time I got there, my threat meter on the right was four homicides, 27 assaults, 34 robberies, and 26 car thefts in the past year. And I was like, I better put my $700 supercomputer back in my pocket, get my car, and get the hell out of here. Um, which I did, so thankfully I, I did escape. Now this, I never really expected. Now, um, I did get a haircut recently, but I, I still have somewhat long hair. So you might not think that Peter, like total like war hawk, wants to work for the army. What, what's that about? Uh, I'm actually like a, a not spending money on war hawk, right? As many people in the room probably are. And so when the CIO of the army uh, reached out, which was also a very strange thing to, to have happened to me, and I'm this guy with long hair and wearing jeans and pumas to every single meeting and refused to wear a suit, uh, I was like, what does the general want? And do I, when I go meet the general, do I like put on a tie or what do you wear to meet a, a four-star general who runs a 70 billion dollar tech budget across his portfolio. I was like, no, he's, he's not calling you because you know how to wear a suit. He's calling you because you know how to do something that they don't know how to do, which is like tap the like unlimited capacity of people that really want to do great things together. And their problem was that they have, I think the army, the US army has about 1.4 million employees. I think it's the biggest quote unquote company on the planet, except for, I think it's like the UK healthcare system has like a little bit more which is crazy, right? So 1.4 million people, the general calls me and says, Peter, I heard about the staff for democracy thing. Uh, it's really interesting. Do you think what you're doing could apply to the army? And so we have to tell me a little bit more about like, what are you trying to do? What are your problems? So the problem is, uh, you know, it takes us like two years to build anything, right? And it costs us millions and millions of dollars and it's not coming out fast enough. And in 2007 and eight, we're still, the US is still in the throes of the Iraq war and Afghanistan and probably some other misadventures that we're involved in and probably still are involved in, but I, I won't get into that. Uh, and he said, so we need to just move faster. And I know that we have really talented people within the ranks of the army that can build great software. 
we, we just don't have a mechanism for doing that. And it's like, well, how many developers do you have in the army? He says, I don't know, because no one in the army's job is to build software. It's like, excuse me, you have 1.4 million employees, no one's job is to build software. He's like, no, their, their job is to, you know, shoot a gun or file a paper or do something else. The contractor's the ones that build the technology. It's like, okay, that's totally crazy. Let's see. Um, I bet within a pool of 1.4 million people, uh, you have software developers that could build stuff. So let's have a challenge. Let's do, it actually turned into an, uh, an employee performance incentive. You can't call these things awards or bonuses or whatever. So it starts to get really, really governmenty in there. And so, okay, so we can do like an employee cash incentive uh, for $30,000, we'll see what we can do here. And so what happened was, the wrong slide is not next, uh, in, I think we ran it for 90 days, uh, and my total number of apps for Army Apps was somewhere around 60 applications were built, and one of the most interesting ones was this thing called Shock. It's a very Army name for an app. Uh, S-H-O-K was an abbreviation. And what Shock did was you could put it on a, an iTouch or an iPhone or, or any iOS device, and when there was a big concussion, right, like basically a bomb exploding, it would forward all of its data right back to the forwarding base through email, right, secure email. Uh, it would take a picture, accelerometer data, GPS, and send it right back to the base. And what it was doing for $500 in hardware and software built by an Army engineer, they had better intelligence coming from that than they were from getting from Raytheon that was building systems for like 25 and $30 million. And this turned into four years Four years of apps for the Army where all we did was the first year, I Strategy Labs and me specifically, wrote the strategy, built a little internal social network in the essentially the Facebook of the Army, which is really cool. Uh, got developers together, they built stuff, and they said, great, your problem solved, right? You don't need me anymore? And they're like, that's right. And I was like, wonderful, because I don't want you to pay me. I don't want government money to do this stuff. I actually want you to spend less money on all this stuff. And that's what this is about. So Apps for the Army was really interesting and, and sort of special. I haven't seen this happen in any other sort of DOD context all over the world. And maybe, maybe it's happening, maybe I don't know about it, but I would think, I probably would know about it. I've got my ways, anyhow. <laughs> uh, perhaps you've seen things like data.gov. Uh, data.gov at the time was sort of the preeminent open data uh, portal for the federal government. Uh, my former client, Vivek Kundra, who was the CTO of DC, he moved into the White House, then started standing this up. Um, and then now I'm seeing, this was just last year, was it? I went down to Jamaica at the request of the World Bank. Uh, and so there's like a, a pan-Caribbean open data and open innovation ecosystem just evolving now. So I, I didn't, again, I didn't get into apps for democracy to make money as a government contractor. Same thing with apps for the Army. And I never knew how this stuff would play out. And to see that it takes sometimes five to seven years for emerging markets to start to adopt the sort of innovation approaches that we have, say, in America or Europe, have is so interesting to me. So the Caribbean, anyone here from the Caribbean? No? Anybody want to go to the Caribbean? <laughs> all right, I thought so, yeah. Uh, so when you go there, don't just lay on the beach. I think all of you seem to be pretty, pretty switched on, as they say. Go meet some entrepreneurs and talk to people in the innovation ecosystem down there because the Caribbean, I think, over the next 10 years is going to be so interesting. And I don't know if you've spent any time there. You might think of, oh, it's just Jamaica or it's just uh, Barbados. They're all highly connected and they're all getting together to build new applications to help the region. And I just think that's a fascinating thing to see. Um, how many people have seen anything that the World Bank has done with regard to open data? Does anyone follow international development? Uh, so this is one of the coolest things. If you go to, I think it's data.worldbank.org, and I, I forget the URL because I haven't slept in like 30 or 40 hours <laughs> having just landed. But, so the World Bank probably two years ago, I think it was two years ago, having seen what Apps for Democracy was doing and Apps for the Army, said, you know, we should have all of our data open as well. So if you ever need a really good body of sort of development indicators, right? So, uh, you know, childhood mortality or, you know, GDPs for a specific slice of the population, this is sort of the, the database to go to. With this data, they were able to launch Apps for Africa. And in Apps for Africa, I think the one of the most interesting and most used applications that I saw was this little mobile phone application. It was all based through text messaging. It wasn't even you know, iOS or Android. 
and it was meant for fishermen. So you can imagine that you've got you know, African fishermen off of whatever coast they are, and they're trying to find which port they should go into to sell their fish at the highest price. And so through this mechanism, they're able to text in, say, like tuna, 100 pounds, or, or whatever else it might be, and see that like these three ports were the like, ones with these prices, and they can go to the right place. So love the idea that the World Bank has been getting into that space specifically. Um, and this, has anyone been paying attention to things like Crowdflower, I'm sure you're hearing crowdfunding all the time. So this is remote work. And the reason why I'm showing this is it's sort of a layer on top of open data, it's the human layer. So in Jamaica, their issue is that they're trying to figure out how do we get our workforce into sort of a high technology context. And you can imagine in Jamaica, they're not gonna be, they're not gonna be building the next laptop. They're not gonna be inventing the iPhone anytime soon. Maybe they will one day. It's just the infrastructure for manufacturing is not exactly there. The intellectual capital might not be there. If it is there, it's leaving and coming to the US or going somewhere else. And so what they're doing is they're finding that this remote work, people can do, they can get you know, 10, $15 an hour using a platform like Crowdflower to work on these open data initiatives, populating great databases for people like the World Bank uh, without having to leave the island. And then that income stays there they start to understand how best to use internet technology. So I think it's remembering that there are people involved in all this data. When you hear the word data, you immediately think of machines. The machines need to get the data somehow. Um, and if that is a bridge in emerging markets, uh, crowd flowers of the world to helping people sort of ascend that, that tier of technology understanding, I think is a great way to do it. Um, the last thing I'm gonna share before, before we break is gonna really be focused on people. So after we did all this Apps for Democracy work, and how's my time looking? Five minutes, I'm gonna do this really fast. Uh, I don't know, it was probably, probably three or four employees at the time, we decided we're gonna do something like public, right? I know this is your second year. So we launched something called DC Week, and it was all about bringing together designers, developers, entrepreneurs, and technologists, and in the first year, about 6,000 people showed up. And then the next year, 10,000 people showed up, and the last year, 12,000 people showed up over the course of eight days, 125 events across the city. And the idea is that you have to convene innovators. I mean, this, this forum itself, the symposium is about convening innovators. Uh, you have to convene them physically uh, to get real action to happen. This doesn't just happen you know, in a Facebook group or a LinkedIn group or through email or otherwise. And then you really have to inspire people. And one of the ways that we inspire people certainly is through you know, big talks, uh, but I would encourage you to think about who are those leaders that you really need to have be here that can catalyze true movements. This is the former mayor of Washington, D.C. And so typically a conference organizer would say like, well, yeah, we're going to invite the mayor because he'll just kick it off. By bringing the mayor into the fold of our hyper geeky, very creative, very entrepreneurial festival, it turned into, I think there were no less than three uh, policies that passed over the course of the past two years that benefited directly the creative and the technology community. So that's like, bring them in, because the, the mayor might not knock on your door, or, or the CTO might not, not knock on your door. But once you do convene people, activate them. And so we certainly do a lot of hackathons, and I think you've had a couple here. I think it was Hack uh, SA that was mentioned all around music. Um, but if you can, get people very focused. So the last DC week that we did, the last hackathon that we had, uh, this was during Hurricane Sandy, uh, which I don't know if many of you paid a lot of attention on this side of the world to that, but it was a, a dev devastating hurricane on the east coast of the US. It happened the weekend that we were doing our hackathon. So what was built that weekend was smartresponse.org that instead of donating your money to the Red Cross, which is a great organization, but it's a very big organization, and that money goes way up and may never get back down to the ground. Um, what Smart Response did is it mapped basically the shortest route to action on the ground for money. So it said, okay, who's got boots on the ground? Who has 50 people actually in Brooklyn, New York right now? And let's make sure that the money that's getting donated right now goes to them right now, which was sort of an innovative way of thinking about it. Because most people are like, oh, I'll just donate to the Red Cross. And then things like what happened in Haiti happens, which is a billion dollars never gets spent. They still have it. They still have the billion dollars, an extra billion dollars that never got spent on Haiti because it's too big of an organization. So the idea is try to get that money down on the ground faster. I think I'm probably out of time and I may also be out of slides, which makes it perfect timing. Data, that's me. Connect. Love you. See you soon. Cheers.